the hey, all you sports fans out there, the two most fear to you, the individuals, part of the collective. Welcome to Fast Track Sports Track College here on Talk Radio. Version of the OMSR. I'm your brief but concise host. Will the alternative has been sports throw? Always do a little show like this. Let you know the clip order coming up in the whys and wherefores. Get a longer highlights reel that way. Plus a quickie sport rant to the segment. So we'll talk briefly and concisely about Kobe and his Twitter thoughts, Twitter pitter patter. The sound that it makes, what does it matter? Well, it's being discussed as Kobe understanding or fitting in, take your pick or choice of phrase as with other African Americans in, in, in relatability type deal. This is all taken from earlier on the herd. A quick sport rant. I'm going to expand a little bit further when you hear Colin talk about like the common denominator, the, the things that connects people, not just when it's socioeconomic. The, the ethnicity thing goes right out the window. Okay, real quick. Clips. This is interesting to me. Let me ask you this. Does the... I always found this fascinating with O.J. Simpson. Many of O.J. Simpson's best friends were guys at the Bel Air Country Club. Right. Okay. O.J., because of his stardom and wealth from college on, related to rich people, black or white. And at that time in America, more were non-black. I found it interesting during the O.J. trial, outside of Al Cowling, many of those interviewed for Kobe Bryant, or for O.J. Simpson, non-black. Yet, he was largely supported in the African-American community, though I would argue at the time, he really didn't relate much to the African-American community, though they rallied behind it. In the instance with Kobe Bryant, is Kobe seen in the black community as being, hey, one of us? I, I, w I would say no, and here's why. When you look at Kobe's background, he grew up overseas. Italy. He grew up in Italy. So, as a black person, or, or many, you know, black people, they think of Kobe as an outsider because he doesn't know about the str the struggle. The struggle. Well, that's that's the key the key key phrase right there. The struggle. You had that growing I, up when, I, you, when your mother told you what? My mother told me, look, you need to you need to play ball. That's the way you're going to get into college. That was my way out. That and that's been a lot of guys. I know a lot of guys in a similar situation. Sure. Their only way out is to is to play sports or other things to, uh, you know, attain a, a scholarship or, or something to find their way out of, of tough situations. You know, when you look at Kobe, you don't see that because he grew up overseas. His dad was a, was a basketball player. He grew up in a different culture. It's a resentment. I don't know if there's a resentment, but I think the black community doesn't really identify with Kobe. Okay, so let me ask you, should Kobe Bryant... I, now, I th again, I didn't grow up, I, I grew up with a struggle, but it's right. not the struggle perhaps you grew up with. So when Kobe says this, I think, good for him. When he says, he, we want to advance as a society and a culture, but if something happens in the African-American community, we're supposed to come to its defense, well, then how far have we progressed as a society? Now, I, I hear that, and I'm like, yeah, hey, good for you. That, that's the way it should be. What do you hear? <clears throat> well, I think that what I hear is, you know, Kobe wants you know, a colorblind society. It, and I think that's what we eventually, that's what we're striving for, but that's that's not reality right now. And I think a lot of people in the black community say there's a lot of wrongs that are still happening against black folks. Do you believe there's a high percentage of African Americans who would prefer you just take the side of our group? I do. I do think there's a there's a high percentage of, of, of black folks that would say, you know, let's stick with your own. Let's 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 be unified. By the way, we supported you with Colorado. Exactly. Exactly. We supported you with Colorado. You know, we want a unified front. But here's Kobe. You know, again, going back to his coach, his roots, his real roots, being overseas, it's not the same culture as. You know, African, African, Virginia. Right, African Americans in America. So I don't. He doesn't see eye to eye. He sees things 
differently through a prism of affluence or wealth. Exactly. Which in America has largely been the non-black experience, is it, what you're saying. Exactly. It, it should be noted Jim Brown, who has been outspoken for 40 years on this, has on occasion uh, struggled with Kobe. Right. I think over this, uh, this, this kind of very issue. So, you know, it, it, during the Clinton era, we had an emerging black middle class. Yes. Yes, we did. Yes. And, and I think because of that since then, and it continues to grow, I imagine, I don't have all the demographics, but I, I do, when I read this, I can kind of sense some resentment. Apparently, Kobe got smoked on Twitter. Oh, he did. It was... Oh, you what? You were there? You oh, were there? yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, there's this, and there's a lot of people that knows about it. There's like a, I don't know, there's a strong, what they call, black Twitter. That's what it, if you look up hashtag black Twitter, there's like a strong group out there and when this whole when this whole story came out from I guess to the, the New Yorker that uh, Kobe Bryant did I mean there was a strong backlash about it um, because Kobe it just seemed like from the black community he didn't he didn't have the right perspective about how the whole Trayvon Martin case was done yeah it's all hey look I like to you know what what's what's great is here I am I'm a black guy you're a white guy and I mean, I now, it, seems, it, seems, it seems like we have more in common than a lot of people probably here at, at, at this own company right here, ESPN. Well, it's always been funny, and I've said this for years. You start relating with people in your life that you share basically the same neighborhood because right. your kids play together and you go to the same school. So in the end, if you really think about what connects people, it's often income which creates lifestyle for you and your children. So the truth is, we're probably going to the same hotels. Probably if I go to New York, the same 15 restaurants you recommend to me. Our kids probably have the same experience. The race thing's a non-fact. Yeah, you know what, You know, he, he, here's another thing. You know, you talk about the struggle. My kids don't know, my kids probably don't know about the black struggle because of what you just brought up, the, the income. You know, I've been fortunate and blessed to to be able to play the game of football, which provided me, I guess, an elevated, uh, put in, being put up in the elevated, yeah, yeah. Bra in a different income bracket. So my kids, they're in a, they're in a different situation than maybe a lot of other African Americans uh, out here in society. So it, it, it's really, it's they really interesting. It's a, it really is an interesting topic. So you're basically dealing with what John McEnroe terms. Somebody once said about John McEnroe, how come your kids aren't great tennis players? He said they have a disease, affluenza. <laughs> so you're dealing with the same issue that people of, you know, means often deal with. How do I inspire my kids? Where's their fear? Where's their aspiration? It has nothing to do with the race. It has to do with income. Right, and, and I think it's up, to, it's up to parents, myself, my wife, to, you know, to show our kids, to give them a, a broad, you know, to give them a broad spectrum of, you know, this is where this is where I came from. I always try to, you know, I always try to bring my kids down. I keep them try to keep them grounded down to earth. I show them where I came from. Other people, the struggle other people go through. I make I, my kids hitchhike to school. So to me, that's what I do. Put your thumb out and get to school. It works wonders. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I'd uh, I'd have to agree with pretty much everything. You know, we just heard. On or from the herd. All right, quickie sport rats. Where I grew up, the Northern Rockies, all right, let's just call a spade a spade, in Salt Lake City, Utah, I walked away from the Mormon church by the time I was 12, 12 or 13. But before leading up to that and then after, I had the good fortune of going to elementary school for many years and then the junior high that serviced our particular elementary school with a black kid. The only black kid, I swear, in all of the East Bench of Salt Lake, which is an, an affluent stretch for 20 miles. And the thing of it is, we all went to this elementary school from the outer boundaries, the outer limits of the perimeter that the elementary school would take. You understand what I'm saying? And this elementary school in the big neighborhood that it pretty much was centralized or centrally located in was a very richy rich type neighborhood. 
And so all of us dudes who were known not to be in the neighborhood, oh, they live in that neighborhood. They must be poor. You know, we're shunned by the rich chicks, always hanging out with the richy rich guys. If you didn't go to the local Mormon church, it's known as the LDS ward, even less of a reason to fit in. But our connecting bond was football and basketball. But yeah, we had Nicholas Slock, Lincoln Hershey, Chris Norris, my black buddy, first black guy I ever knew for years. Now, I'm not suggesting that makes me more knowledgeable of the African American experience than Kobe, but I do know that Chris at times, you know, it was a struggle for him. Never went to his house because he was way out on that eastern side of where our elementary school. I was the only one of us who came from the west side. West side and east side. And incidentally was the only one who could bridge that gap between the rich chicks and, and our football clique. Uh only because the gal was really tall for being in fifth grade. <laughs> Anywho, I know Chris lived or grew up in a, uh, like a bungalow, which comfortably seats for lack of a, of a better phrase, three to four with eight to nine people. Aunt, a couple cousins, and to share his bedroom with, and a sibling. Yeah. So, he didn't have the biggest of struggles, the African American experience, but it wasn't easy for him either. But, our collective, you know, we were the best athletes in the school, and that continued on into, into junior high. But junior high sports in Utah are not as big as they are elsewhere. You know, able to get you noticed, and much like high school gets you into college in some ways, you could, you could say that about junior high and high school. Hey, it don't work like that in Salt Lake. And, you know, being ostracized at times by the rich crowd, we didn't see Chris as a black kid, and he didn't necessarily see himself at times, although there were times it came out, like when I wore some plaid pants to school, it was like, damn, dude, those are some loud pants. Everybody cracks up, and I'm the one who's left there going, huh? Didn't get it, you know. Funny black comedian thing going on there in fifth grade, or was it sixth grade? I don't remember. But other than that, you know, we are all a bunch of guys. The ethnicity didn't matter. With regard to Kobe, yeah. Got to give it, you know, maybe he can't, his relatability at times, I mean, what he's saying is, you know, factually true, but it may be insensitive, and that's not necessarily his strong suit. But he is a good guy. All right, all the video highlights courtesy to ESPN and The Herd with Colin. Everything else to the old Mazar. That's it. Thanks for watching. Those silly DIs while you're celebrating your favorite sport. We are later out in here.